nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities, presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. The topic, freedom of the press, regulation of the media. Should federal regulation of broadcasting be abolished? Is television news being slanted? Now, here is Peter Hackus. For half a century, radio and now television have served the public with a wide variety of programs. From time to time, groups and individuals have complained that some programs give only one point of view, that some news programs in particular lack balance, are biased or slanted politically. There have been complaints from those who say that they've been unable to get on radio and television to express their views, and from political candidates who claim that they've been denied equal exposure. Broadcasters, too, have complained that theirs is the only branch of journalism regulated by the government. That, say some communicators, is against the First Amendment press freedom guarantee. In the course of policing the airwaves, does the government intervene too much? Does it unfairly try to influence broadcasters, as some have charged, by threatening to withhold station licenses? From the National Press Club in Washington, welcome to another round table presented by the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Four communications experts will discuss the topic freedom of the press, regulation of the media. Included in our panel are Kevin Phillips, a television commentator, author, and newspaper columnist. Mr. Phillips, a Harvard Law graduate, was chief political analyst for the 1968 Republican presidential campaign. Bill Monroe of NBC News. Mr. Monroe is a former NBC Washington bureau chief who later became Washington editor of the Today Show and is now executive producer of NBC's Meet the Press. Clay Whitehead is now a fellow at MIT and Harvard, having spent four years as director of the White House Office of Telecommunications Policy. Ralph Winter, Jr. is a law professor at Yale. He has served as consultant to a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. Professor Winter has been a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington and is adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Moderating the discussion will be Ellie Abel, dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Mr. Abel was a foreign correspondent for the New York Times and later became a correspondent for NBC News in Washington, during which time Dean Abel won the Peabody Award for Outstanding Radio News Reporting. Now our moderator, Ellie Abel. Thank you, Peter Hackes. Our roundtable topic tonight is freedom of the press, regulation of the media. It's a topic that agitates a great many Americans in our time, particularly when they think of the broadcast media, television and radio. Are they too powerful? If it is true, as we are told, that broadcast journalism has become the preeminent source of information for the American people about the state of the nation and the state of the world, then the question arises, should the government not be more vigilant about what goes on the air and who puts it there? Do we need more regulation or less? Or should we be regulating in a rather different way? Does the First Amendment which guarantees freedom of the press apply to journalism on the air as well or only to the printed word? And if it does, how do we justify any federal regulation at all in view of the explicit injunction in the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law and so forth? These are serious questions. And among our panel members today are men of strong views, strong views on these very questions, and you'll be hearing from them in a moment. Consider, for example, the question of access to the media. Who is entitled to reach that enormous national audience? We've heard in recent days the case of Jack Anderson, a rather well-known Washington correspondent, who recently taped a television interview with President Ford, an interview which the three commercial networks 
he tells us, have refused to broadcast because it was not the product of their own staffs. Or the earlier case of Frank Mankiewicz and his associates who went to Cuba and taped an interview with Fidel Castro. Part of that interview did in the end appear on the CBS network, but it had to be somehow disguised as a CBS product, which in fact it was not. If men as prominent and as experienced as Mankiewicz and Anderson can't get airtime on the networks, what hope is there that the views of comparatively anonymous Americans are being heard and will be heard? There is the question of media concentration. Here in Washington, for example, we have exactly two major newspapers as of this moment. There is a question whether there may not be one before long. Yet, there are a much larger number of broadcast outlets in this area. The press is not regulated. The broadcasters are on the theory that there's a scarcity of spectrum. Is this good public policy? I'd like to begin with Bill McGill, Bill Monroe, sorry. Bill, uh, my old friend and colleague, has made a kind of off-hour career of studying the Fairness Doctrine, the First Amendment, and its application to broadcast journalism. What about that, Bill? Do you have any doubt that the First Amendment does and should protect the broadcast media? And where, do you, where does that bring you out when it comes down to regulation? I think the First Amendment should protect broadcasting, but I don't think it does. Some years ago, I worked for a newspaper. As a young man, I was very impressed with the spirit of independence on the part of the editors of the newspaper. They didn't care whether something they put in the paper offended a major political figure. Some years later, I went to a television station, and slowly I discovered that the managers of the television station were concerned about government. They were a little bit afraid of government. They had a timidity, a consciousness of government looking over their shoulder that the newspaper publisher and editor for whom I worked did not have. And I began to feel that I was in a medium that was a little bit less than free, and it worried me. I think we have gotten into this position because uh, Radio and television began as media only about 50 years ago. When each of these two media began, they did not appear initially to be important news media. They looked more like entertainment devices. And we developed a regulatory, app, a regulatory apparatus based on the necessity to allocate channels that was not originally intended to get into control of content, but has gotten into control of content. Uh, partly accidentally because we didn't realize what we were doing and partly because control of content of any media often serves the purpose of politicians. The politicians would very much like to get hold of some leverage over the print media if they could because they can make it easier for themselves if the politician can write the, the rules as to how journalists cover politics. And they are trying to do this and to some extent they have done it for the broadcast media. So I think the whole regulatory apparatus for example, the Fairness Doctrine has resulted in broadcast media which are less adventurous than they could be, don't have the full courage of the, of the print media, and that we can get away from this if we realize what's happening and go in the direction of less regulation, throw out the Fairness Doctrine, throw out the so-called equal time rules for coverage of political campaigns, which, among other things, has deprived the American people of debates such as they had between Kennedy and Nixon back in 1960 and abolish most of the Federal Communications Commission uh, insofar as it applies to program content of broadcasting in particular. Kevin, what do you think about all well, that? Well, I tend to react somewhat cynically to people talking about the, uh, the poor media at the, under the thumb of the politicians because I think we've seen in the last couple of years that this, if anything, it tends to be a little more the other way. I've seen polls, I think U.S. News and World Report in the last two years has asked opinion leaders in the United States to rate the power centers in this country. And in 1974, the television networks were rated ahead of the White House. And in 1975, it was virtually neck and neck. John Conley just, uh, oh, I think two months ago or so down in Texas spoke about how the, uh, the network newscasters, the anchormen, had more power than the Speaker of the House more power than the majority leader of the Senate or the minority leaders of both houses. 
And I think this is what we're up against. Uh, we're not up against a purely commercial situation. I think it's a, a question of power, power that is responsible or responsive to nobody. I mean, perhaps the people at the networks will say that, yes, Walter Cronkite wouldn't be there unless everybody liked him, but in point of fact, they'd only get to choose between three. I mean, it's not as if you're choosing between X number of politicians. So I think the power that they have is quite out of keeping with the, uh, the situation that applies to one newspaper or two newspapers, unless, of course, you can make an argument that some of the major newspapers and media conglomerates have the same power. But I think we're dealing with a situation like the, the runaway power of the, uh, the Wall Street people in the 1920s before they were regulated, the railroads in the 1880s before they were regulated, and I think we need something that either forces the networks to open up access or breaks up the networks into smaller units that would be more responsive to the average American's opinion and less, I think, arrogant than what we see at the present time. Kevin, that's a view that I've heard from the other side of the political spectrum. It surprises me a little bit to have it coming from you. Uh, but um, on this matter of too much power, or how much power the broadcasters actually possess, uh, define that a little bit more, if you can. Where does the power reside? What is it that they do that gives them this power? I would say that the principal power with which I would be concerned that I have seen a lot of conservatives express concern over really resides with the networks as opposed to the individual television stations. After all, the stations have to go through a regulatory process. The networks do not. Uh, here you have these three operations that have this incredible power to beam into the, the living rooms of the nation, the political agenda for the nation, the people who say in the morning or the evening, who is good, who is bad, what happened in the world, what you're to think about, what the agenda is. And to me, it's not the stations, not the individual stations in Albuquerque or Dover, Delaware or whatever. It's networks. It's people who are not responsible, who sit up in New York behind uh, a whole corridors of power, 10, 12 offices removed from any place the public could possibly penetrate to without a, an official pass, just like the Pentagon. And these are the people that are calling the shots. Now, I think that's what public policy has to reach toward. Okay. I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, understanding why it is that uh, the supposed great power of the network, and I'm, I'm skeptic networks, I'm skeptical of any assertion that one particular institution has all that much power over us. It, it sounds sort of like some conspiracy theory. But I, I really wonder why it follows from that, that there has to be some kind of program content uh, uh, over television programs. Uh, in, indeed, I'll go so far as to say it, 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 it most certainly does not follow from that. Uh, I can't imagine a, a, a better way to centralize control uh, in one body than to say the government ought to regu uh, regulate program content. Then you can be sure that indeed uh, 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 they will have power and it will be exercised uh, w with a deliberation uh, and an intent that, that may well be lacking uh, in the present situation. Let me put a proposal to you. Uh, suppose uh, we were to uh, make the uh, uh, <coughs> television uh, stations, the broadcast media, like the newspapers. Privately owned, um, uh, open, uh, 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 given economic con uh, uh, conditions to competition from uh, weekly news magazines, other newspapers, uh, 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 monthly uh, magazines and the like. Uh, suppose we were to uh, abolish the FCC, have the government uh, define uh, frequencies as they are so that you won't have the chaos that would result if everyone was trying to broadcast on the same frequencies. Put all the frequencies in the, ch in, in the channels up for bid. Let them be sold and then let these, the, the property rights in these frequencies be reflected mm -hmm. in a piece of paper, freely transferable among people. Uh, would not that take care of all of your objections? I think it would take care of some. Actually, I merely indicated support for the Fairness Doctrine at the present time as opposed to favoring the approach, per se, of program content. I think if there were a very effective application of, of economics to break up the concentration, to open it up, that is a preferable alternative. Now, whether or not what you have uh, precisely outlined is the answer, I'm not sure, but I think it's a movement in the right direction. Well, you, you remind me a little bit I, 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 of... Um uh, indeed, I think that, 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 that the media is in great peril today, uh, not because there is or wasn't an administration out to get the media, 
but because the dominant themes in American political life are bound to be turned against the media. Uh, you are, are, I think, the most articulate spokesman in picking these themes up. Uh, you have picked up the Galbraith native theme about uh, the manipulation of people by the media, the power that, the, that, that advertising has so that people have to be protected. You've picked up uh, the theme about uh, uh, economic concentration, which Mr. Galbraith and Mr. Nader uh, uh, used. Uh, and, and indeed, you even picked up Mr. Gardner's theme uh, about the influence of, uh, of, of wealth on, 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 on the political process. Uh, and I think, I think you have shown how these dominant themes in American life uh, will inevitably uh, be turned from the auto industry uh, to television. And, and it, just is, uh, it just follows as night follows from day. Um, uh, although, let me say in your defense, I regard you as a, as a true son of the Harvard Law School. <laughs> Coming from a Yale man, I know what it means. <laughs> I think we ought to be very clear about the nature of, of the problem. And I think Kevin has hit it right on the head when he says that the nature of the problem is power. Uh, after all, the, the, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, is basically a power document, and we sometimes tend to forget that when we debate it in the most lofty terms. The power in television is un, unquestionably in the three television networks. And it seems to me we have to ask, what is that power, and then is it a healthy state of affairs for them to have it? And in my view, the power is very simply described as the power to exclude. The television networks put on a very homogeneous kind of programming, uh, both in their entertainment and in their news. It is kind of schmoo-like in its character, so it's very hard to either get a hold of it or define it. It doesn't offend terribly any one group of our very diverse population. And yet, when you look at it, you, you notice mainly that it is exclusive. It excludes this, it excludes that, it excludes in many ways the great richness and diversity of American life and American political thought. It's just not there. So the power to exclude in programming, be it entertainment or, or news, is a very important part of the power. The other part of power to exclude is the power of the television networks and the broadcasting industry to exclude competition. I think that uh, anyone who believes that the television networks really don't like regulation is being very naive. The current game in, in Washington is the FCC and the Congress protecting the television broadcaster and the television networks from any meaningful economic competition so that the profits continue to roll in. And at the same time, applying to them certain kinds of controls about what kind of programming they must do because they have this protection. It's, it's that exclusion of competition and the consequent exclusion of diversity of points of view that I think has to be recognized as the big problem in television power today. I take it the discussion till now has not produced any outright advocacy of abolishing the FCC or regulation, although Bill Monroe went I'm pretty really, close. fairly close to that. I, I thought I was there. Uh, <laughs> well, up to a point, but it seems to me that what Tom Whitehead is saying, what Kevin has said, seems to me to suggest that what we're saying is we want more regulation. More uh, regulation of some varieties, perhaps, less than others. I, I'm not an expert on uh, either the regulations or the enabling statutes of the FCC, but I certainly would think that one point that deserves very minor elaboration here is the reversal of roles of the, uh, the ideologies. Because I would think of myself in this particular context as a, a conservative uh, hyphen populist and populist in the sense of opposing the new power centers. And if that is considered non-conservative by the, uh, the powers that be who want to conserve those power centers, uh, I think it's amusing. I think it's also uh, a reversal of roles that deserves elaboration. And after having seen conservatism on the losing side for a long time with banks and railroads, I'll be happy to see it on the winning side. Well, I think Mr. Phillips is opposing the so-called new power centers with a theory, which Mr. Winter has commented on, of taking some power away from the networks and giving it to the federal government, which is the only way you can ameliorate network power in a regulatory process. And this seems to me to be a remarkable thing for a conservative to be advocating or a libertarian. There is no way to cut down the power of any media except by government supervision. And any time you do this, you enhance the government's power to first influence and perhaps later control the media. 
Now, eventually, we're not going to become a, an authoritarian state uh, if the government cannot control the sources of news in this country. But it seems to me by in enhancing the regulatory apparatus and giving the government increasing le uh, leverage, increasing influence, increasing control over the media, uh, we would be going in that direction. And I'd like to suggest also that if we think we can get along in this country with a genuinely free press on the basis of newspapers can be free, but broadcasting cannot, which is where we are right now, I think we're sadly mistaken because we are uh, developing a philosophy to the effect that government regulation can make the media perform better. And we're beginning to accept that philosophy because we're accustomed to it as applied to broadcasting. And it seems to me to be a dangerous philosophy, and it's a philosophy that uh, some students according to one poll uh, that came out of the University of Texas seemed to be adopting. Somebody did a poll asking uh, a number of people in the community whether there should be a law against slanting news. Uh, teachers, people in the street, uh, people in general had different percentages of agreement with this idea, but the students at the university were highest of all among the categories in saying, yes, there should be a law against slanting news. Uh, this indicates a lack of perception of what the First Amendment is all about. And eventually, if we keep fastening the apparatus of regulation on broadcasting and accept this philosophy that the government can supervise the media, the newspapers are going to go down the drain as a genuinely free institution. I have to uh, demur slightly from your statement, Dean Abel, about my point of view and disagree almost completely with, with Bill. Uh, I think that the premise that the only way to cut down on the power of certain institutions is to build up government power is fundamentally wrong. And yet that's exactly what we've done in the case of television. The government in the 34 Communications Act and subsequent rules and regulations of the FCC has on the one hand fostered a great amount of economic and consequently political power in the three television networks. And then to counteract that tremendous private power that it's allowed to accumulate in three hands, the government is increasing its own power. So you have these two huge power centers, one in Washington and one in New York, going like this, trying to keep each other in some kind of balance. And it's the poor viewer, it's the public that gets caught in the middle there, and I think they're losing. Well, I know that you've been long been concerned with this concentration of power, and you've had time since leaving the White House, perhaps, to reflect on this at leisure, I hope. Uh, how would you deal with it without building up government power even further? <coughs> well, I would start from the premise that Bill starts with and, and that Professor Winter starts with. And that is that the First Amendment, in the kind of society we have or want to have, has to apply fully and completely to broadcasting. Broadcasting, television, the electronic media have to be a full-fledged member of the press in this country. They can't be second-class citizens. They cannot be regulated by the government for the reason that, that Bill is talking about. You get the politicians and the network types kind of responding to one another, they develop a synergistic relationship, and it's, it's fundamentally very unhealthy for the democratic process. It seems to me what, what you have to do is to set up conditions that encourage more competition. You have to recognize that the networks can't have it both ways. They can't have their tremendous monopoly power economically and still have absolute total freedom. This society is just not structured to have any institution have total freedom and lots of power. So you have to look at issues of media concentration, and fairness in the economic aspects of competition. I agree with Bill that the fairness doctrine ought to be done away with. I think it's fundamentally unconstitutional. However, the only way you can justify doing away with the fairness doctrine in the face of the network's economic power is at the same time to require that the networks be prepared to sell time to anyone who wants to buy it for any kind of political broadcast. What the networks would like to have is for us under the banner of the First Amendment to do away with the fairness doctrine and then have them continue to have the power they have now to refuse to sell time to people like Jack Anderson or to Mobile or to any other group that they think is putting on a political ad. Let I, just, me, I think that's wrong. Let me try and approach here. I think what we're dealing with is a, an old progression of arguments and problems that have been seen in other industries. The first and most desirable answer in anything has always been competition. Apply the Jeffersonian precepts. And the, the second and, uh, and more unfortunate but often necessary approach is what I would call Rooseveltian. In other words, when you had industries that couldn't develop competition or bastions of privilege that were just simply incapable of being turned into a Jeffersonian process, in the 1930s you had to have regulation. 
And in hearing Bill describe the imminent fascist peril of regulation, I was reminded of all the Wall Street lawyers that were uh, trundled down to Washington during the mid-1930s to talk about how this or that New Deal was about imminently to lead to Mussolini on the Potomac and that sort of thing. And I think if we can't solve it in the Jeffersonian way, and I don't think we can because the power of big broadcasting will be applied in the same way to block it, the remedies you're talking about, that the power of big X or big Y was applied in previous decades, then I think, unfortunately, it's going to be necessary to have the regulation to prevent the type of abuses, which they would like to have. They'd love to have a no-fairness doctrine and just sit up there and, and do what uh, more of what they do now. Well, Kevin, I, I, I must say, I, I, um, uh, forgive me, not only do I want to disagree with you, I want to correct your history a little bit. Uh, in the 1930s, the history of the New Deal is essentially a history of government and industry moving together toward monopoly. Uh, and now, if that is supposed to be reforming concentration of power, uh, it, 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 we are a lot closer to uh, 1984 uh, than we, we were then than we really thought we were. I mean, it's just utterly wrong to review or, or to view the 1930s and, and, the, and the New Deal legislation like the NRA and everything else that was done then uh, as in any way directed towards the decentralization of power in this country. Indeed, they, indeed they had uh, specific provisos in all those laws saying that the antitrust laws did not apply. Both you uh, and uh, Mr. Whitehead uh, are talking about a problem of power which the government has created, uh, and, you are, and, and you are providing remedies which calls for more government intervention. That won't work. That simply can't work. That creates more power rather than less, more monopoly rather than less. Any regulation of program content will be regulation designed to put on programs those things the regulators want to see. Uh, we have had, in recent years, a well-publicized commissioner of the FTC, uh, well-known uh, for thinking that licenses should be taken away because, quote, public interest, there was not enough, quote, public interest programs uh, by the licensee, uh, who at the same time, uh, in an opinion, uh, would raise the First Amendment when the FCC cracked down on the topless radio broad uh, broadcast. Now, that may be good taste, as they say in the tuna ad, but it doesn't taste good because it is nothing but the subjective view of that particular regulator. Now, when you give that person that kind of power, you are not decentralizing it. You are not giving it to the average citizen of the United States. You're not doing any of those things. If I may jump in there, and I wasn't suggesting the NRA, I believe that that was a little phrase that escaped my mention. But if you take the Glass-Steagall Act or something that forced banking to separate itself from investment banking, you have a type of situation that might be somewhat uh, raise an analogy here. If you take the sort of uh, extreme program control away from these people, the right not to take somebody else's documentary but to purely produce it in-house, that's the sort of problem you had with the, the banks and the investment houses being under the same roof. Would you do and that to the newspapers? Would you yes, require? I would not cross ownership uh, up a couple of notches. Would you I do it to the would. New Republic? Would you what say you can't have a magazine at the, uh, like the New Republic without somebody being able to walk in and saying, here's the article I want you to print this week. It disagrees with your point of view uh, all the time. You never represent this point of view. Let me have access. Well, the banks have to be licensed by uh, regulatory authorities in their states. And consequently, I think that gives you access to the... Not the uh, newspapers. No, it, in the case of the broadcasters, which is what I was talking about, I think that gives you something of a parallel in terms of the regulatory jurisdiction, which I don't regard as ephemeral in terms of the uh, communications regulatory power of the people over the airwaves. You haven't stopped me fearing a Mussolini on the Potomac. Well, I have to uh, defend myself here a little bit. While I agree with Kevin's definition of the problem, uh, I, I don't want you to go away, Professor Winter, thinking that I agree with the presumption that there should be more government regulation to cure the problem, because I agree completely with you that more government regulation just exacerbates the problem. Uh, How then do we deal with There is ample evidence to, in any field of regulated industry, uh, be it trucking or banking or anything else, to show that the federal government is worse than private enterprise in delivering any of the kinds of services that the marketplace will sustain. And that applies clearly in television broadcasting. The problem, however, is that we have a very long history, some 40 years now, of the courts interpreting the First Amendment of the Constitution around the 1934 Communications Act. 
We have a history of the courts giving the FCC, as it has with all the other regulatory agencies set up under the New Deal, an incredible amount of discretionary power so that we have the FCC practically deciding day by day what is a program in the public interest, what is good for the American people. The broadcasters, the executives, I'm not now talking about the people who put the programs on, I'm talking about the people who own and manage the networks, are very clear as to who their principal audience is in terms of gaining profit. It's the FCC. You put on the kind of programming that the FCC wants so that you can be sure to keep your license, so you will be immune from a challenge, so that you'll be immune from competition. And we cannot ignore that whole history. Well, I happen to agree with you that, that we should have totally hands-off on the part of the federal government. We can't just change it overnight. We have to ask, how do we get from here to there? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to and ask. I how think that the way you get from here to there is to begin to move in a direction where the government controls are more structurally oriented. So that instead of saying, we, the FCC, will decide case by case, program by program, whether a program has been fair, we, the FCC, will decide what 14 or 15 or 16 program categories are good for the American people and require broadcasters to put them on. And instead of that, you move to something that disengages the government and yet requires the networks and requires the broadcasters to be more responsive to that great diversity out there. For example, access. Jack Anderson and people like that who put on programs, people who want to buy time to express their point of view, can't set up a radio station, can't set up a television station because of the way that we have structured the giving of licenses. So it seems only reasonable to me to approximate the conditions of a free market in the short run by saying that the people who have the monopoly right to own those stations have to be willing to sell time to anyone who wants it, so that anyone who wants to get access can do so. That is a step in the right direction. It doesn't take us all the way, but it's a step. No, for one thing, it seems to me to reserve time for those who have the most money. And there may be perfectly respectable points of view uh, behind which you can't amass that critical mass of money. But a yes. lot of the complaints have not been from the people who have lots of money. They've been from people such as Senator McGovern, who wanted to use the great outreach of television to reach all those people out there so that he could raise money. Bill Monroe. May I suggest a different kind of access from that advocated by Tom Whitehead? I'm not satisfied that television and radio on the station level or on the network level provide adequate access. I think there ought to be something in the broadcasting media comparable to the letters to the editor column in almost every American newspaper. Somebody ought to be able to write into a station or a network and say, what you said Thursday night was wrong and here's why it's wrong, and have a good chance you can't guarantee this kind of thing. It's not guaranteed in the newspapers, but have a good chance of having the letter uh, published in a television form, maybe by interview. Or it could be worked out, I think, if broadcasting became uh, interested enough in it. But there's no reason why the networks are compelled to provide the views of Jack Anderson to the country. Uh, and we are not denying the country the views of President Ford, on whose coattails Mr. Anderson sought national television exposure. So I don't think the networks are necessarily to be terribly faulted for that. And Tom, I think you're exaggerating as a problem in deregulating the power of the networks. The networks have power, and uh, examination of the network's power is a, a valid consideration. Everybody ought to uh, be aware of it. But uh, they don't have quite the power as some people think they have. You just used your two fists a little while ago and said, here are the networks, and here's the national government. And I don't think, I think David Brinkley brought up the possibility, uh, is that democracy going to be overthrown uh, someday by CBS? Or might it more likely be overthrown by somebody in the White House? Another thing about network power is that more people in the country, in terms of getting their news from television, get it from local stations than get it from the network programs. And the networks have to compete in terms of information with newspapers and magazines and radio, local and network. The power of the networks is not as all-encompassing as you can easily make it seem to be. And you have diversity among the networks. Witness the Vietnam War coverage where a lot of critics of television perceived a difference in approach between the ABC uh, newscast back some years ago and the NBC and, and CBS newscast. Whether that difference existed or not, a lot of people thought it did. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to claim that the networks are all bad. Uh, like any institution that, that makes the kind of profits they do, they must be doing something right. But 
on the other hand, I, I, can't, I don't think I can quite see the argument that because they're doing some good things, that they should enjoy the kind of special protection from competition that they have. I think that they should have some obligations. I think that the fact that I can buy a full page or a half page ad in the New York Times or in Time Magazine or in the New Republic says something about the character of the print media that's missing on television. I've, I've got to say. Why can't I buy five minutes of time on CBS to express my intensely held views about something? Why can't somebody out there in Keokuk, Iowa buy five minutes of time to get across their point of view? Why is the American public to be protected from this kind of rich diversity and be constrained only to a very narrow kind of national viewpoint that the three networks decide to give us? I just don't understand why there is the need to be, for the networks to be protected to that degree. Well, I wonder, problem. however, whether in fairness now, whether the FCC over a period of years may not have created a situation in which the networks are that much more reluctant than they might otherwise be to provide airtime, uh, because they might then be required to provide time to reply and all the rest of it under the application of various FCC rules. In fairness to the networks, that is definitely the case. The FCC has set up a scheme whereby the, the networks are held responsible for everything that they put on. But, but Tom, and isn't there a... that has to be examined along with the other kinds of changes. Isn't there a practical objection to that? If you had a rule like that, uh, you would either put the networks in a position of having to sell time uh, to uh, uh, just imagine what it would look like if everyone could go around and buy five minutes of time on NBC. Uh, the networks would soon work it out, one way or another, so that all these five minutes took place uh, at a particular time because they wouldn't want to have the competition that would occur when everyone turned from the five minutes the that was The rating bad. competition. Right. Yeah. Possibly 6 a.m. Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah I think they probably not. I, mean, I, I would think that that, that that kind of a proposal would die uh, of its own weight if it were put into effect. I, I know you believe in that rather than what I was pushing because you think yours is more politically, your proposal is more politically possible than mine. But I think if we really give any attention to it, you'll find that it's not. The networks being a national organization really have to be the way they are. Uh, you don't find McDonald's uh, uh, varying uh, their hamburgers uh, uh, between Philadelphia and Washington or something like that. They're providing a national try. Indeed, part of the thing is that it is a homogeneous product. They provide advertising for Kojak or whatever all over. Uh, and I think the networks are always going to believe, are always going to behave the way they are. Uh, the only way around this uh, is to set up more local stations, I would think. Independent stations make it cheaper for people to enter the broadcasting business. Uh, and then just through uh, the workings of the market, see, see what develops in terms of people buying time and the like. I'm sure you'll, uh, 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 any proposal allowing anyone to buy five minutes of time would just if it were in effect for you, it would be laughed out of existence. Well, I've spent a lot of time here discussing remedies. I don't think we've spent enough time, perhaps, on the reason that remedies may be required. This whole question of, we've heard a lot about the homogenization of the product, which incidentally is a very American uh, standard right. applied in other branches of American industry as well, uh, and I guess the secret of successful mass production. Um, but what about this question, I think Kevin has raised it more than once in his writings, of media balance and fairness. I don't think this discussion would be complete without uh, hearing from you on that. Well, I think there's a political demand which we have to put in the equation. When talking about remedies, it's all very well and good to uh, indulge in academic theory, but the, the fellow in, uh, in Wichita or Boise or South Brooklyn doesn't want academic theory, he wants something that goes to what he's concerned about. And the people that write the remedies are people in Congress and people in the administration who again relate to a political reality syndrome. And I've thought that a fair amount of this discussion here does not. Uh, anything, any reasonable remedy which is going to be imposed here is going to go through uh, the Congress of the United States, which is obviously not a highly academically oriented or aware institution, to say the least. And it'll come through the communication subcommittees that are run by people who I wouldn't say they're in, in bed with the broadcasting industry, but they're at least uh, aware of the, uh, the color of the covers. And I think it's a real problem. The, the chance of getting any remedy that isn't just 
something basically pretty simple that the, the fella out in Main Street wants. It's going to put these people under the thumb a little bit. And when we talk about regulation, almost anything you're talking about is regulation, too. I mean, regulatory legislation that comes from Congress. This isn't going to come from a fairy godmother who gets it out of a uh, quarterly review, for Pete's sake. So we're talking about the regulatory process, the legislative regulatory process or the, the agency regulatory process. You've got to deal with it politically. It's going to come from political demands. I've seen polls. The public feels strongly this way for reasons that we all know. We've all raised different ingredients of why they're concerned, whether it be the McDonald's type of programming or the power or, uh, or the alleged bias. And I think this is what people should be concerned about, what the average guy in the country thinks and wants out of a communications network which is so powerful that he should have a say in what it does. One of the big problems in television today is that it gives us only the Big Mac or the Quarter Pounder. It's only what McDonald's wants us to have. And yet if you go out, you discover in looking through the yellow pages, that there are an awful lot of, of specialized restaurants, restaurants, ethnic restaurants, neighborhood restaurants. There are all kinds of different restaurants to choose from. And you don't read about them all in the newspapers all the time, but they're there and they're supported by customers. I'm not the least bit concerned about the competition within the three television networks, or you can encompass public television and call that four ways of competition if you want. What I'm concerned is that there is no opportunity for other people to enter and compete to set up fifth and sixth and tenth and hundredth television networks so that all of that diversity of, of demand out there, this is a very diverse and very rich country. There has to be some way of getting television to serve all of those different interests and tastes and needs. And the way you do that is through creating opportunities for more people to come in. Now, so if you try to do it through the federal government, which is what Kevin is saying, Kevin was perfectly right in saying that people out there are, are dissatisfied with the, the power of big institutions. They want to do something about it. But if you try to do it through the power of big government, all you're going to do is constrict more and more. It seems to me what you've got to do is open up. And I don't, for one, think that there's any way in the longer run that we're going to do it very effectively under the system that we have. The only hope for us, it seems to me, in the longer run, and for my part, I've only been talking about the next decade here so far, is cable television. It's got to be enough outlets, there have got to be enough channels, 20, 30, 50, 100 channels, so that all of that diversity and richness can come to be, so that people can pay directly for their own programs instead of having to wait for 11 million other people who some advertiser is willing to support to pay the networks to carry it. That's the ultimate answer. Tom Whitehead, I uh, knew we'd get around to cable eventually. Uh, I've been hearing about the promise of cable for as many years as I've been involved in broadcasting, and that goes back to 1961 or two. Um, and I've never seen it mature. Um, there's something wrong with the vision of bountiful programming by talented people that doesn't provide an economic underpinning. Uh, I live in New York. I see what passes for production on the cable systems. It's shoddy. It's shameful. It shouldn't be allowed. They wonder why they can't get any more subscribers. I'll tell you why. They don't provide a service. Um, and yet, all the behavioral scientists at all the universities keep talking about the promise and the beauty of cable. Now, how about this notion that cable television has been oversold in recent years? Anyone have a thought about that, or am I dead wrong? Well, I think that many media are oversold in their early days. The comments you made about tele cable television programming today reminded me a lot of what people had to say about television programming itself in the late 1940s and the early 50s. So this was surely a trivial medium that all the stuff it was putting on was garbage and no one should bother to take it seriously. And I thought some people were saying that tonight about present day television. I think they were. But any new technology, be it uh, television itself, be it the radio, be it stereophonic records, uh, be it cable television, goes through kind of a growth curve. And at some point it reaches the point where there's enough of a critical mass of people who are connected to the cable, enough entrepreneurs who want to provide programming. Uh, cable, in spite of the bad press reports in the last few years, has been growing, I think, at a, a very steady rate. More and more new customers, new entrepreneurs getting into programming. And I think it's only a question of time until cable matures to the point where it 
offers the potential in the electronic media for television to be much like uh, the totality of the print media. You know, there's more to the print media than newspapers. There's all those magazines out there. And I think we can hope one day that we'll have the, all the electronic magazines uh, equivalent to our print magazines. Thank you, Tom. The subject of media regulation is a difficult and complicated one. What is fair and balanced to one side may appear biased and slanted to the other. So how far should or can the government go in regulating broadcasters. Now, to challenge our speakers on media fairness and public responsibility, let's go to our experts in the audience. Now to our audience. The first question, please. My name is Nick Johnson. I'm with Access Magazine and an organization called National Citizens Communications Lobby. And my question goes especially to Professor Winner, I believe, although I'd be interested in the others' answers, too. We're interested in, in answers. We want to know what we can do to provide more access and make the system work better. And I want to know what you're prepared to be for now that I understand so clearly what it is you're against. Would you support doing something to remove the barriers to entry that AT&T and the networks have created to prevent new networks from being established? Would you require lower power for stations so that there could be more than a handful in a large community? Would you require the sale of time, as when 14 senators asked to answer President Nixon and were turned down by every network, which had provided the President free time and refused to provide the United States Congress time for pay? Would you forbid joint ownership in the same community of stations so that there could be more owners? Would you stifle or encourage the development of cable television and pay? Would you require cable television to make channels available to all users and create sufficient channels so that that would be possible? Would you make free time available to candidates and community groups and so on? The others have come forward with some proposals, I think, even Bill Monroe with his idea of letters to the editor. What are yours? For a minute, I thought you wanted an answer that went something like yes, no, yes, 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 <laughs> no, maybe, and I haven't thought about it. Uh, You'll forgive me if, if I, uh, uh, my memory misses one or two of those questions. Uh, my proposal, which I had thought I had made quite clearly, was that I thought the government ought to do the one thing which the normal operation of the market can't do, which is define property rights in frequencies so that you don't have people broadcasting simultaneously over the same frequency so no one hears anything. Having defined those, I then would make those things subject mm -hmm. to sale by auction by the government to anyone that wants to buy them. Sealed without, bids. Yeah. Well, no, no. Sealed <laughs> bids are easily rigged. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, anyone who wants to buy them without requiring that they stipulate or run public interest programs, won't, uh, um, uh, uh, will handle racial matters properly, will obey the fairness doctrine, uh, will give access, and all of that. Uh, these things would conven could then be freely exchanged. I think you would find the price of radio stations plummeting because what people are in television stations, because what people are really paying for now is a government monopoly when they go out and buy these things, and that's what makes it so damn expensive. I think then you would create a new structure in the industry with what much more easy, much easier access. I would not, under any circumstances, uh, have the government involved uh, uh, in uh, uh, what I've been calling program content, where you force a, a, a station to let someone go on the air. It seems to me any time the government does that, it necessary, unless they're going to let everyone do it, uh, which uh, would be more chaos than letting everyone broadcast at the same time and the same frequency, uh, the government has to make some decision as to what kind of ideas are uh, 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 within the universe of discourse and what kind are not what kind of worth hearing, what kind or not, and those are the very things I don't want the government to do. I think that's a, that's a concrete proposal. There's been no objection to it from any member of the panel other than on the grounds that it can't pass uh, because the networks um, uh, are against it, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps many congressmen uh, are against it who uh, uh, are allied with the networks. My criticism of the networks is uh, uh, that they are already too far in league with the government uh, that they are, 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 in a way, supported by the government in, in, in a monopolistic uh, uh, adventure. And I would, I would like to see that ended by getting the government out, not by getting it in any further. 
Uh, we go to this side of the house. Vera Glasser of Night Newspapers. The panel has uh, barely touched on public broadcasting, and it seems to me that it might be very interesting and perhaps relevant here if we could get a quick uh, opinion from each of the panel members as to the usefulness of public broadcasting. For example, uh, uh, do you think it has set an example in moving us toward erasing some of the shortcomings that we have been talking about, bias, etc., or has it merely turned out to be in its short history just a carbon copy of commercial broadcasting? I'll start on that. I, I don't think it's uh, become a carbon copy. I think it's developed a new form of obnoxiousness that doesn't reflect the, uh, the pattern on commercial television. For example, uh, Channel 13, I guess it is, up in New York, only in the last couple of months had a, uh, a show where they interviewed Abby Hoffman, I guess it was, and they tracked him down and paid him $2,500. Now the networks will pay $2,500 for a hot ticket. But they will not uh, meet with somebody who's under federal charges at the time and then let them edit the tapes and so forth and, and say that this was a hot thing to put on television because there's a great public demand for this. It, it reflects an attitude among the part of a lot of these people. They're looking for a different type of thing. I don't think they duplicate commercial television. I think, unfortunately, they often have in their public affairs programming a kind of new leftish tilt, which I think is uh, rather unproductive and unfortunate. I like their... Uh, uh, dramatic and operatic and symphonic programs. I think they're useful. I think that's all they ought to do. They ought to leave the public affairs uh, programs to people whose uh, range of uh, awareness goes beyond Abby Hoffman and insulting French people in Louisiana. I think public television has, has added measurably to the diversity that we have available to us in this country. Uh, it largely goes after a minority audience. Uh, that's what it was originally conceived to do, was to present alternatives to the mass audience fair that, that the commercial networks tend to put on. And I think you have to give them some credit for developing some programming that we would not otherwise have available to us for trying to offer a slightly higher cut of programming. On the other hand, they were supposed to provide an across-the-board alternative. And there's some reason to believe that they uh, are mainly satisfying the affluent upper class's interest in alternatives to television. And you wonder where all of the other alternatives are. I think public television could be a lively and worthwhile competitor to the commercial networks, particularly in regard to news and information. But it has been denied primarily by the Nixon administration, but to some extent by the Congress. The insulation from government that would help it, the regular funding that would help it, and the structure that would make it viable on a national basis. I just have to point out one more time, Bill, that the Nixon administration proposed a five-year funding bill, which the House of Representatives has refused to pass and has elected for one-year funding, at least at the committee level. I uh, happen to have some involvement with public television, and to me it's disappointing. Uh, I think television is a vastly expensive medium. I don't think the critical mass of money or of talent has ever been made available uh, to give us a real taste of what public television is capable of. We are, I believe this last funding bill provided 65 million, is that right? I think the final version was 80 million going up to 100 and some million. No, but I mean for this, this next year. I think that's right. <laughs> now that's 80 million to be divided among 200 odd stations. Uh, it's not a great deal of money when you look at the budget of say a station like WCBS in New York. It's a joke. And yet um, I'm disappointed with public television. I think by and large it's triumphs. The ones that Kevin mentioned are imported triumphs. Some of them I knew well on the BBC before they ever came over here. Uh, I don't argue that they shouldn't have brought them over, but I don't have a sense that the creative excitement that I know exists in American journalism, in American theater, and in the American arts uh, is getting through on public television. And I, I, I'm very disappointed about that. Isn't there an issue about public television that, that goes beyond whether we like the programs uh, or whether they could be improved. Public tell there, there's first the question whether it's the right remedy, the best remedy for 
some of the evils we all concede to exist in the present situation. Uh, beyond that, it seems to me to be um, uh, a, a vehicle sitting there uh, ready um, to take over the private networks. Uh, uh, it can be there, and I am not. I, I, I may be mistaking the tenor of the panel. I'm not sure who said it, but uh, my understanding of what has happened in foreign countries when the government has owned the television stations is contrary to the happy view uh, we hear. Uh, as I understand it, de Gaulle uh, was able to keep himself uh, on and to exclude his competitors far beyond uh, anything that ever happens in the United States. Uh, Winston Churchill, I understand, uh, uh, could not appear, was not on the BBC, was not allowed to be on the BBC until he returned to the cabinet, I guess in 1939, because he was thought to be too controversial. Uh, you know, there seem to me to be some very fundamental questions uh, beyond whether the programs are good or bad, and, and I'm not sure that, they, that, that the answer is cut at all in the direction of saying that we ought, uh, that, that we ought to continue it without really addressing those questions. In fairness, I'd simply not like to make the observation that while it is perfectly clear that public television in France was a direct instrument of the presidency, and I was there at the time, for example, of the student rioting in 1968, when not a foot of film of those riots was allowed to be shown on French television uh, on de Gaulle's personal orders. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to assume that because that happened in France, uh, every other form of non-commercial broadcasting in other countries uh, is under the same arrangement. Uh, the BBC, the German television, um, are the ones that I know best. And I would argue that there is at least as great a diversity of viewpoint on those non-commercial systems as we have in the United States in total. Uh, but that's my own personal view. Well, you've all been very patient, and I want to thank um, our panelists, Bill Monroe of NBC News, Kevin Phillips, syndicated columnist and television commentator, Clay Whitehead, former director of the White House Office of Telecommunications, and Professor Ralph Winter of the Yale Law School. I'm Ellie Abel, and thank you all for being with us. Good night. This roundtable discussion has brought you the thoughts of four experts who have differing views on how the government should approach media regulation. It is the aim of the American Enterprise Institute to illuminate issues of the day by presenting many such views in the hope that by so doing, those in decision-making positions will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackes in Washington. Public Policy Forums is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C.